Greetings all. Welcome back to my channel. Now get ready to learn about Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's prose piece, uh, The Quest, that you could find in his book, The Discovery of India. It is the third chapter. Actually, a very short video on the outline about the same topic, especially some details about the author and about the, the different segments of the particular chapter was published previously. And uh, the same link is also attached in the description. Uh, please go through it and uh, then you may continue with this video so that you may uh, be able to connect with the current session, right? Well, uh, when it comes to the discovery of India, uh, it was written by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru uh, as he provides a broad view of Indian history, philosophy and culture. He wrote this book during his imprisonment and he provides a broader view of in Indian history and philosophy from the perspective of a freedom fighter, right? So as a freedom fighter, uh, this book offered a new kind of perspective uh, towards India and Indians, I would say. So this chapter, number three, the quest, uh, is divided into 10 parts, right? So all the 10 segments are described very clearly here in this video. And the very first part is the panorama of India's past. Nehru feels proud of India's past. At the same time, he also feels ashamed about certain aspects of India like uh, its superstitions, outward ideas and poverty. Nehru's thoughts on India loom beyond imagination as he thinks about his country, beyond its physical and uh, geographical aspects. Nehru was uh, thrilled by the Mohenjo-daro in the Indus Valley civilization that existed almost uh, 5,000 years ago. He talks about the changing civilization or because of the context that uh, India held up with uh, the Persians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Arabs, the Central Asians, and the people of the Mediterranean. So uh, Nehru had uh, read the history of India and its abundant and uh, rich literature. He cherished the records of the ancient travelers who came from China and uh, Western and Central Asia into India. Nehru felt proud of the mighty Himalayas and the rivers flowing through the mountains. Nehru had visited the old monuments and ruins of the Ajanta and the Ellora Caves. He was even proud about the Kumbh Mela. He cherished the history of the preachings of Buddha at Sarnath, which actually he envisaged as the glorious past of India. Nehru visualized the Darbar of Akbar, the Great, at Fatehpur Sikri. So the long panorama of India unfolded before the eyes of Nehru. Nehru's thought on British rule was like one unhappy interlude interlude in the long glorious story of india so here you could see uh, 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 pandit jawaharlal nehru's view or perspective about the panorama of india's past so now the first segment is over and now comes the second part nationalism and internationalism According to Nehru, nationalism took a natural growth in these times. Nationalism was fading with the impact and effect of internationalism, says Nehru. But according to him, war took over the spirit of nationalism. And he says that old traditions cannot be easily erased. New traditions should also be given space, claims uh, Nehru. And amidst uh, its fervor for nationalism, India had also stood in awe and uh, accepted internationalism too. Now comes the third segment, India's strength and weakness. So according to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, India lacked technical progress when compared to Western countries. 
western countries used new techniques in their military regimes and dominated the east very easily but indians had their mental alertness and technical skills in the past i mean the ancient times but later there was a deterioration in technical progress to the later centuries indians desire to absorb new ideas and uh, to retain older values nehru urged the indians to escape the shameful subservience and their submissiveness to foreign authorities like the english right so now comes the fourth segment the search for india nehru tried to get a real understanding of india i mean the connections between india's past and the present india's present as he says uh, is an odd mixture of medievalism poverty misery and superficial modernism especially amidst the middle classes of india nehru set out towards a voyage for discovering india so this was his inner urge nehru cherished the great variety of the indian people he traveled extensively in his 20s along the 48 districts of agra and au i mean uh, which are thrived as the very seeds of ancient and medieval cultures nehru traveled widely throughout india in his 30s during the election campaigns he was proud of the diversity of india and uh, he was happy about the infinite variety of the people of india and now comes the fifth segment bharat mata on a meeting people throughout india nehru talked about hindustan and bharat he thought that the peasants needed greater awareness nehru talked about his journey that started from khyber pass to kanyakumari deep south peasants came out with the same question everywhere they they eagerly talked about their troubles like poverty exploitation and their debt the large gatherings crowded nehru with chants like bharat mata ki jai nehru explained to the masses that bharat mata is not the land but its people so now comes the sixth sixth segment the variety and unity of india as nehru says the diversity of india is immense he admires the different cultural traits of the people of india that includes the patans of the mm. northwest and the tamils of the far south the people belonging to diverse cultures differ in their face and figure food and clothing and also in their languages says nehru so according to him bengalis the marathas the gujaratis the tamils the andras the oriyas the assamese the malayalis the sindhis the patans the kashmiris the rajputs and the great central province of the hindi speaking people have continued to maintain their distinct cultures for over 100 years see what a variety right so even the outsiders have become distinctly indian in their stay for over a few generations affirms nehru see the christians jews parsis and muslims so here we could find that pandit jawaharlal nehru was very much proud and was in aim for the variety and unity of india and now comes the seventh segment so between the years 1936 and 1937 nehru traveled throughout india people wished to see him everywhere nehru used an elephant and sometimes he used a camel or a horse or a steamer or a paddle boat or even a bicycle and sometimes even by walk to reach people belonging to the different parts of the country he used microphones and loud speakers to address the large gathering so he took much pain to meet the people of india from uh, the far north to the deep south he traveled along the length and breadth of the indian subcontinent 
And now comes the eighth segment called general elections. So Nehru's tour over India was connected with the general elections. Nehru believed in adult franchise, that is the right to vote. According to Nehru, elections are an essential and inseparable part of democracy. His speeches were concerned about elections and told the people that they should understand the purpose behind it. So now comes the ninth part or the ninth segment, the culture of the masses. So Nehru was actually shocked to see that the illiterate villages of India, they have memorized the verses from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and they were full of references from both these books. I mean, the sacred books of the Hindus. So the cultural background of the masses, according to him, was a mixture of popular philosophy, tradition, history, myth, and the legend. Now comes the last part of the prose, two lives. So Nehru was in his trial of discovering India that connected its past in the present. So obviously he had to deal with two lives. One dealt with his busy occupations. I mean, his uh, political strategies and uh, something related to his party and elections and all. And the other one, the other life of Nehru dealt with the privacy of his mind in which he always cherished his India and the Indians in it, right? So this is the final segment of uh, this particular prose piece. And I uh, hope you'd have understood the entire session. So if you really like this video, do like it and you may share your thoughts as well. And those who haven't subscribed it, do subscribe. Otherwise, it isn't fair, isn't it? So with this, this is Wahida signing off. Thank you.